think that worked. Hi, everybody. Um, so today we're going to try some stuff. We're going to talk about um, synthesizers. We're going to talk about how to make them. Um, not necessarily um, the old school way with circuits, but how we would make them with, um, with software. And so what I thought I'd do is, is, is show everybody um, a synthesizer that's near and dear to my heart. Um, it's a thing called an ARP 2600. And then I thought we could talk about how it works, how it's made under the hood, how it's connected under the hood, and how um, you could go about making something like it in Max. Um, we're going to try to do something in Max. Um, I'm super psyched to do this today. Um, I want to thank uh, Brandon and Kristen for helping me figure out how to use um, Open Broadcast Studio. I have no idea if this is working, but I think it's working. Um, and uh, this is going to be fun. And this is a, this will be a fun thing to add to the um, faculty streams for the IDM Twitch stream. So um, this thing, let me show you this thing. This thing I've got here is something called a TTSH. And TTSH uh, is, 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 um, stands for 2,600. 2600 TTSH. And what it is, is it's, um, it's a recreation of a synthesizer from the early 1970s called an ARP 2600. I am going to um, briefly share my screen and show you some photos of that. This is what it looked like um, back in the day. Um, this is the sort of original version of it. Um, and then uh, what happened was, um, it went through a few iterations. So this is uh, this is sort of the early 1970s version. The mid 1970s version looked like this. It was gray, um, and then it uh, the final iteration of it. The ARP company tried to come up with a. This is another picture of the gray one. Um, the ARP company tried to come up with a bunch of consistent, you know, kind of color schemes for their brand identity, and the final one was orange, right? And so the one we have today. Um, is, is, is based on that design. Um, and so what this thing is best known for um, is it's best known for being a pretty canonical, um, what they call a monosynth. So it's a, it's a synthesizer that can sort of only play one note at once. Right, so I'm playing something. Um, Although there's sort of an asterisk to that, it can actually play more than one note at once with a little bit of work, but it's it's basically plays one note at once. Um, it has a bunch of really interesting features to it, and the in the in the design of it um, was intended to be uh, a synthesizer that could be used by educators, um, a synthesizer that could be used by um, what Alan Perlman, the ARP, the guy who founded the company, um, referred to as, you know, everyday musician. So not necessarily a rock star, um, but someone who could actually, you know, kind of afford this thing and use it. And so it's a beautiful example of, um, of uh, what we call value engineering. So value engineering is usually like a bad term. It's a, it's a thing that um, you use to like, hate on a piece of architecture you'll be like how come this building only has one bathroom and it'll be like well that was value engineered right and so that that's like a, a funny way of saying well they ran out of money so they didn't do it um but this is actually a, a sort of good side of value engineering what 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 arp did was they took a synthesizer that normally you know would cost tens of thousands of dollars stripped it down added some things that you don't normally have in a synthesizer, like built-in speakers, like a built-in kind of self-enclosed sound system, and then made it $3,000, right? So they, they brought it way down. Um, the price point being aimed to be comparable to the amount of money that um, uh, uh, an electric keyboard player would invest in something that was like not a synthesizer, like a Rhodes piano or a Hammond organ or something like that. Um, and it was incredibly successful. Uh, it, it was the only product that ARP ran 
for pretty much its own whole company history. It ran from like 1971 to 1981. Um, and it's it's pretty fun. Um, it is... Uh, like I said, like a, it's a monosynth. The other really interesting innovation that um, ARP really pushed for uh, that, along with the price, also speaks to equity, is that it is a semi-modular synthesizer, which means that you can plug stuff in with wires if you want to, um, but you don't have to. There's actually a default wiring schema, so um, all the jacks on it are what they call normaled. Um, so they have a default input to them. And so that means if you're a keyboard player, you don't care anything about modular synthesis. You don't know anything about modular synthesis. Your ax at home is a piano or maybe like an electric organ or something with a few front end controls. You could bring this home and just make sound with it. And you don't need any wires, right? And this was in um, pretty stark contrast to um, ARP's main competitor, which was called Moog or um, the kind of more experimental synthesizers being designed on the West Coast by, by people like Bukola, Don Bukola and Serge Cherepnin around the same time. So this is a, this is a East Coast synthesizer. And an East Coast synthesizer is a, is a modular synthesizer that has a fairly um, traditional default topology. You have a bunch of oscillators. These oscillators go through a filter, which lets you shape the sound. Then they go through an amplifier, which lets you control the overall envelope of the sound fading in and fading out for like a, for a note. Um, and then it goes out. And then there's an envelope. There's an envelope generator, something that generates the curve for the, either the shape of the sound, the volume overall, or the shape of the filter, or, or other things in between. And then there's like additional good, goodies around it, right? So the, so the goodies around it that the ARP 2600 is best known for is there's a sample and hold circuit that lets you make sequences and there's an envelope follower which lets you do things like plug in a guitar or a microphone and then take that voltage take that um that signal smooth it to get a control signal which then you can use to control other aspects of the synthesizer best known users of the envelope follower would be um, Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend, the guitarist from The Who, used the ARP 2600 all the time as just like a weird noise machine, and he would drive it with his guitar. He didn't play a keyboard into it. He would plug his guitar into the envelope follower and have it do things like sweep the filter. The other um, best known user of this is, uh, is a guy named Ben Burt, who um, was um, the the founding sound designer for um, a, a thing called Skywalker Sound on the West Coast, and he was the sound designer for the original Star Wars movie in 1977. So the voice of R2-D2 is this synthesizer. He took recordings of his child, right, baby talk, um, put them on cassette, fed them into the envelope follower, and had the volume of his kid drive different aspects of the synthesizer and make all these crazy sounds, and that's what R2-D2 is. R2-D2 is an ARP 2600. So I'm gonna give you um, like a tour of this thing and, and tell you what it's gonna, what it does and what all the pieces are. And then we're gonna try to make it, or something like it, um, in Max. So this um, synthesizer has a really nice like pedagogical layout. If you sort of zoom in, there's labels on everything that say what everything does. And there are arrow diagrams. So this is so this thing which says like voltage controlled oscillator two. There's arrows coming in off these sliders, and there's arrows coming out to these jacks. So what that's telling you is it's telling you that this oscillator gets control voltages from whatever's coming in under here. And what those things are by default are the control voltage out of the keyboard, something called the sample and hold out, the ADSR, and some other stuff. But then if I plug in a jack, I'm overriding it. And then everything kind of flows down. So, so the, the default pathway is these three oscillators go into this filter along with noise. There's a white noise generator down here. Um, that whole situation can go into the amplifier and into the mixer. And then there's an attack decay, sustain, release, and envelope generator that can curve all those things. So I have to um, my right an oscilloscope so we can just sort of see what's going on. So what we're going to do, um, 
is just plug in and make some sound of um, you know the actual bits and pieces before we actually play them all together. Um, so if you start with one of the oscillators, uh, let's find an oscillator. The, os the first oscillator, um, you know, sounds like this. It's a sawtooth wave. Um, that's what a sawtooth wave looks like. That's actually the core of all the oscillators. So circuit-wise, every oscillator on this thing starts with a sawtooth wave, and then it gets manipulated, um, shaped through the circuitry. So um, yeah, but that's a basic thing. A sawtooth wave is, um, as its name suggests, an oscillator that just does a vertical ramp in voltage, and then when it hits a threshold, it snaps back down to zero. So it kind of looks like, um, you know, the blade on a chainsaw. That's where the blade on a saw, you know, that's where that comes from. Um, and so it has a um, fairly rich spectrum. There's a lot of harmonics in it. Um, but the other thing that's nice about it is with a little bit of work, you can run it through a thing called a comparator circuit, set at a certain voltage. And then lo and behold, you can turn the saw wave into a square wave. Right? which has a different sound right? and you can sort of see it there right there's a couple others um, there's also a triangle triangle looks like a sawtooth wave that halfway up gets folded back down and then there's a sine wave which is a smoother version of a triangle wave um, the way um, a sine wave is created in this particular circuitry is you take the triangle wave and you run it through something called a Norton amplifier, which is a you know amplifier that doesn't have a linear curve to it. It makes everything curved. It doesn't make it doesn't make straight lines, and so it's ish a sine wave. It makes a sine wave um, that is maybe not the most mathematically accurate sine wave in the world, but it's a it's a pretty pure tone. Um, and then you can do one last thing to the square wave which is you can change something called the pulse width, so how much of the square is up and how much of the square is down. And that changes the sound, it changes the harmonics, it changes the proportions of the harmonics, it's kind of nice. Um, you can also change that dynamically, so you could have an oscillator actually change that over time, which would be fun. Um, so those are the oscillators. There's three of them. Um, part of the ARP value engineering is not all of them have every feature. So the first oscillator can only put out sawtooths and square waves. The third oscillator can only put out sawtooths and square waves, but you can change the pulse width on the square wave. And then the middle oscillator has all four things. It has a triangle, a sine, a square, and a sawtooth, and you can change the pulse width on the square dynamically. Um, and you know that was that was that particular configuration was arrived at through customer discovery, right? They they talked to a bunch of synthesizer players, and the synthesizer players were like, you know what, man, I never use three sine waves, and they were like, okay, we're only gonna invest the cost of circuitry to provide one of those then, right? If that makes sense. Um, when you take all three of them together, you can get this kind of rich texture. So if I take the three of them and put them into the filter, which I'm going to put all the way up. So I'm going to listen to the square wave from oscillator one, um, doo -doo 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 -doo, and oscillator two, and the sawtooth wave from oscillator three. Right, now we've got this like really rich complex tank tone because the three oscillators are a little bit out of tune. I can make them more out of tune if I want. Right? Um, and so one easy thing you can do with these kind of synthesizers is you can make it so the oscillators tune to a chord. And then when you play notes, it's going to create 
you know, a harmony. So here. Right? So you could do stuff like that. Um, there's also, um, not for nothing, a white noise source, right? So it sounds like waves on a beach. It sounds like static. Um, a white noise source on an analog synthesizer um, is typically made by, um, at a certain rate, um, basically sending voltage the wrong way through a type of a, a type of diode called a zener diode so it creates this thing called shot noise um so the speed at which you supply that voltage controls how high frequency the noise is and so you can control that on here um so i can take it and make it go from you know really high staticky noise to something quite low So that's kind of a rumble. What, what that, what that is pragmatically, or what what's actually happening down there, is that um, the random number generator that's that, that is effectively this diode is happening slower, and so you hear a lower frequency, right? If that makes sense. Um, so that's kind of fun. So that's like you know your four noise sources, and then what you typically do with them is you is you mix them through a filter. So I'm just going to turn on the pitched ones. I'll turn on the noise a little bit too. And so there's a filter, and this filter has a frequency. And if you look at the oscilloscope behind me, you can see, let me turn down the noise. You can see what's happening is I, is I move the frequency of the filter up. It's opening up the waveform. It's letting more and more of it out. So it's a low-pass filter. It's a filter that passes the low frequencies. And so if I... Turn this up, you're going to hear something that sounds kind of like a sine wave. And as I move this, more and more of the sound is going to come through. And we go back down, right? Um, this particular this particular filter, um, which is called a four-pole ladder filter, um, also has the ability to self-oscillate. It can resonate. Basically, some of the energy going out of the filter is going back into the filter. That allows it to be made quite sharp in terms of its roll-off with a trade-off that it kind of resonates. It kind of makes a ringing sound. And so that's actually another way to get a sine wave is you can turn up the resonance. So you can do stuff like that. So that's a really nice filter. It's actually so nice that Moog, Bob Moog, who was ARP's competitor, who sort of invented that type of filter, threatened to sue ARP over it. He sort of claimed, like, this is my intellectual property, man. Um, and, uh, and ARP later on sort of changed the circuit design to try to, uh, try to accommodate the fact that... Um, Moog thought he was being infringed upon by having such a such a really sharp filter. Um, so that's sort of that whole situation. And then there is an amplifier, and the amplifier um, amplifies it, fades in and out the entire situation. So it start it can make it go away, or it can make it fade in and out. Um, and that is shaped by an envelope generator. And what an envelope generator looks like. Um, is let me see if I can zoom out a little bit. Oh, wrong way. My bad. There it is. So if you look on the screen, when I play a note, that yellow line is the voltage controlling the amplifier. And so there's four controls. There's an attack, a decay, a sustain, and a release. Moving up the attack is going to make the note fade in. Right? Moving up the decay is going to make the note fade out. 
So I pick up the note and it's gonna take a while to go away, right? Um, so I could have a sharp attack, fades in immediately, and then a long decay and it takes a while to go away. Um, and sorry, that's a release. The attack, right, so the attack is the fade in. The decay is how much time it takes to actually go down to the sustain level. And then the release is how long it takes to go away. Um, so a sharp release will make it fade out immediately. Right. So if you have a really sharp attack, a really short decay, a really short sustain, and a really short release, you get a thing that kind of sounds like a snap, right? Um, and if I uh, turn on the... Um, if I turn on the filter on it, which I don't think is um, too hard to do. So if I if I sort of play a sequence of notes, now you really got it going. I can change the envelope. Change the filter. Get a pretty rich sound. Um, what's controlling the whole thing, if it's important, is um, you can, uh, the original ARP 2600 had a keyboard that you could buy along with it um, that would send the voltage um, necessary to, to, to tell this thing what to do. Um, you could, um, in this version, all I'm doing is I have a little MIDI keyboard, a little Arturia MIDI keyboard, going through a little box on top that's converting it to voltage. So there's a control voltage box. Um, ARP synthesizers, like Moog synthesizers, used um, something called volt per octave scaling. So what that meant was you would sort of tune the system to a note, like a C or something like that. And then um, every volt you added of energy to the inputs, um, it would go up an octave. So a volt of energy would move it from like a C1 to a C2 to a C3. So it would go from a to a to a every time you added a volt, right? Um, so that's kind of the design. Um, there's some other little goodies here, like there is a sample and hold. The sample and hold is like the master clock for all sorts of things. Um, including being able to synchronize the arpeggiator that's on my little keyboard, so I can go like and slow, it, slow it down, speed it up, right? But a more classic thing you do with the sample and hold is you drive the oscillators by its output. So this would um, turn it on and run it without a keyboard. And what's going on now is the noise, right, the noise output on the synthesizer um, is being sampled and held by the clock, right? So every time that clock goes off, it says, hey, noise, how loud are you? And it uses that as the pitch for the oscillator. You can make it not be noise. You can, you can send a sine wave into it. You can send whatever you want into it. But that's a pretty canonical kind of sound effects control system. It's kind of cool. And then there's also the way, one of the things that's making it sound nice is there's reverb on it. And the reverb, I'll take it out for a minute so you hear it without it. This is dry, right? And there's reverb. That reverb is a spring reverb tank. So if I take the thing and kind of rock it back and forth, if you hear that noise, that's actually a spring in a box in there. So that's what's creating the reverb. There's a transducer in an aluminum tank vibrating a bunch of springs, vibrating a network of springs. And that creates the simulation of being in, a, in an acoustically vibrant space, like a, like a bathroom or a church or whatever, right? Um, so that's basically this thing. Uh, you know, 
uh, ARP made a bunch of add-ons to it. They had a keyboard. They also made a sequencer. This is the sequencer. Um, so you can sort of see this little thing that's lighting up here. This would be a way to control it um, to create musical patterns. So there's a whole bunch of kind of fun things you can do with it. Um, and so what we're going to do for the next however long it takes us is we're going to sort of look at this thing schematically and then look at how it would live um, on your computer. Um, the ARP company went out of business in the early 1980s uh, for a couple reasons. They, the, um, one was the, um, they bet long on one particular um, product that flopped. They tried to build a, a guitar synthesizer, like a thing where literally you would have an electric guitar where each string could play uh, its own synthesized note. Um, they were a little too early for that to be a thing. Um, and they were also, as a company, a little too unvertically integrated to make that a thing. And so it, it basically bankrupted the company. Um, but they were also facing increasing um, pressure from larger synthesizer manufacturers. ARP was a, for its entire run, was a small company uh, in Massachusetts. Um, they were one of the first electronic music uh, companies that dealt in synthesizers and keyboards that took the same approach of courting endorsements from um, famous popular musicians as guitars had been doing for years. So um, one of the ways ARP was really groundbreaking was um, by actually partnering with, you know, household name rock stars uh, to create these really innovative designs. So, um, you know, so an ARP 2600 appears on records all over the place. The Edgar Winter Group used it. Joy Division used it. Jean-Michel Jarre used it. You know, the Who used it, right? If you, if you listen to Bob O'Reilly, there's an ARP 2600. Um, so lots of people in different styles of music used it. Alan Perlman, the guy who started the company, ARP, uh, was an engineer. Um, his practice before he got into music um, was he worked for, you know, he had an engineering company that specialized in looking into how to make circuits uh, more reliable uh, based on a wider range of temperature exposure. Um, so with resistors and capacitors and transistors and all that stuff, um, if you move them into a, a space that has a very different temperature, they'll change their behavior. And so he was one of the pioneers in, in circuits that would compensate for that and also the material science of compensating for that. And he had a bunch of patents. And it turned out that, that one of the places, one of the industries which really needed that was audio electronics, right? Going from the studio to the stage meant that your synthesizer might be going from a nice air conditioned dry space to something where it's 100 degrees on stage because of the lights and everybody's sweating. And so it goes out of tune. And so he thought his patents might be useful in that way. And so that's where that sort of came from. Um, and so he was an interesting guy um, in, in a lot of ways. But yeah, this thing is this thing is this thing is fun. It's sitting in the audio lab. Y'all should come over and use it when you return to campus and let's um, I'm going to share my screen now. We're going to talk about how this would live um, inside of Max, um, and we can we can we can play around a little bit. So I'm going to hide this. Burp. Yay! And now you see my screen. This is a Max patch, um, and this is a Max patch that is going to be our little sketch pad for today to actually make some sound. The, the All it's doing right now is it's metering the actual ARP coming in. So we're going to kind of use that as a benchmark a little bit um, for, for figuring out what we're going to do. I'm going to hide the um, OBS stream um, so that I don't, but I can see it on Twitch still. Um, and so that's kind of fun. So we can sort of see what's going on. And so uh, if you've never used Max before, one of the things that's really great about it is it's a visual programming language. It's a visual programming language for music and multimedia. It was started 
Um, in the late 1980s, I was developed in the late 1980s at a place called Earcom in France, which was a computer music research facility. The idea being to make a software, a, a creative coding software of sorts, that would be accessible to musicians. And so one of the ironies of doing this in Max is Max um, implements a skeuomorphic design principle modeled after analog modular synthesizers. You have a bunch of boxes and you hook them up with wires in the same way that with these synthesizers you have a bunch of boxes and you hook them up with wires. So it is nice and appropriate that we're going to try to make an ARP. Um, so the thing you start with um, when you're, when you're, when you're um, making a synthesizer on, on Max is you typically start with an oscillator. Um, and so the, the four canonical oscillators that I described um, as, as part of an ARP 2600 exist here as well. Um, a, a sawtooth wave, you just say saw and a tilde. A square wave, you say rect in a tilde. I'm going to make some comments. Sawtooth, um, rectangle or square, right? Square wave. Um, a triangle wave, um, I believe you just, I have a funny feeling you just say triangle. Now you say tri tilde, actually. So you say tri tilde. That's cool. Um, and then a sine wave, a good old sine wave is called cycle tilde. All right, so this is a triangle. Um, and this is called. And this is a sine wave, right? So these are your, your four basic things. Um, these are objects in Max. Um, Max has a palette at the top with different types of objects. This is called an object box. An object box has a thick border. And you type in a word. And if it recognizes the word, it loads in the little algorithm that supports that word's function. So if you type in metro, that's a, re that's a metronome. If you type in random, that's a random number generator. If you type in penguin, you're going to get an error. It's going to say, I don't know what penguin is, right? Um, and, so it, and so learning Max is more like learning a foreign language than a programming language in some ways. You develop a vocabulary. All the objects in Max that make sound, I'm going to make the screen a little bit bigger so we can all see, um, end in a tilde. Um, so a tilde uh, by itself, not over a letter. Um, uh, that's because um, some smart ass thought that looked like a sine wave. There's no other meaning to it. Um, but what that means is if you're going to work with Max and you're going to do audio, one of the first things you have to do is figure out how to get the tilde character on your keyboard. Um, on an American Macintosh keyboard, it's the thing above the tab key to the left of the number one if you hold down shift. That's where you find it. It's in different places on different kinds of keyboards. Um, and that's important because a cycle object without a tilde is a completely different thing. It is not a sine wave generator. It's something else. Um, so that's what these do. If we want to listen to them, what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate um, this final bit of circuitry that I was using over here. Um, these are multiply tildes, so these just take the signal that I'm connecting into them and multiplying them by this number. And then this little speaker guy is, is, a, is, a, um, is a digital to analog converter. Um, it's a DAC. Um, and a digital to analog converter, as its name suggests, is a thing that takes the numbers that are happening generated by this system, because we're inside a computer now, so everything's numbers, um, and translates them into electrical voltage that you could send to speakers or headphones or whatever, right? Um, and so that's sort of your destination to hear something. So if I listen to a sawtooth wave and we turn it up, ah, we hear nothing. That's because we have to give it a frequency. We have to tell it how fast to play. Um, one easy peasy way to do that is to just hook up a number box to it so we can hook up a number and say, hey, I want you to be at 200 hertz. And that is a sawtooth wave of 200 hertz. Not bad. Um, let's, let's, let's hook this 200 number up to everybody and listen to them in turn. Um, so that is my sawtooth wave. Let's hook up the square wave, hear what it sounds like. Yep, send in the 200. 
cool. Um, the square wave, just like the one on the ARP, has the ability to get pulse width modulation. So by moving this number from zero to one, I can change the shape of the sound. It's kind of cool. Um, triangle wave should sound a little bit mellower than a sawtooth wave. Yep. And a sine wave should sound mellowest of all. You should only hear one harmonic. So if we turn this in, right, it's kind of pure. All right. So that's sort of our basic, you know, layout, right, of stuff. Um, and so if I was going to mimic, like directly mimic the ARP oscillator um, layout or whatever, right, I would say something like this. I would say I'm going to make me a slider. Um, and that slider is going to be the, the base frequency. And then I am going to add in the frequency from a keyboard. Um, and then I'm basically going to make three of these things. So the way this all kind of pans out, or the way this kind of looks, is if I if I want if I start with a keyboard, um, the keyboard the easiest way to play with a keyboard on, on Max is with a thing called a K slider. Um, this is just a, a thing that looks like a keyboard. Um, it puts out not frequency, whoa, um, but MIDI, um, and so uh, it puts out integer numbers for the keys. So middle C is going to be like a sixty. Um, if you send it into an object called MTOF, this will convert it to frequency, um, right? So um, the A above middle C is 440. That's commonly understood as A440. I'm going to take a quick, um, you know, rant for a moment to talk about what that means. Um, so the so frequency is something you can measure um, with a meter. Um, like a frequency meter. Um, pitch, which is the thing that the keyboard puts out. MIDI is a representation of pitch. We talk about pitch when we talk about music. We say, I'm playing a C or I'm playing an F sharp or I'm playing a whatever. Those things are, are, are um, not mathematically encoded originally. They're culturally encoded. So those are, those are, those are part of a, of a schema of a musical culture. So different musical cultures have different ways of talking about pitch talking about tuning. So the MTOF object, that object that I'm using to convert MIDI to frequency, um, is using a um, standard Western tuning system called A440, which means the A above middle C is 440 hertz, 12-tone um, equal temperament, which is the tuning system that, you know, sort of dominates mainstream Western-influenced music today. So when you listen to uh, you know pop music on the radio there's a really good chance it's 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 tuned in 12 tone equal temperament a440 that doesn't mean you're supposed to do it that way that doesn't mean that's the best way to do it there's a million other ways to do it but this is a this is the way it's going to work for now and that is the way it was designed on the ARP as well so um so we're going to just try it and then we'll do something weirder with it later okay back to the thing um so this it's going to tell me what frequency I want to be. So if I hook this up to here and turn my sawtooth wave back on, right, um, I should be able to play melodies now. Right? Doesn't sound all that great. Sounds kind of digital because it is. But it is, in fact, in tune, and that ain't bad. Um, so if I can, if I take that and I say, well, this is going to be one oscillator, right? Um, and so the way we're going to do this, I think, is we're going to treat each of these things as kind of their own little modules. Um, and so let's pretend that this is um, the most complex thing on the ARP, which if you remember from what I was doing with hand waving, was voltage control oscillator two. That was the one with all four options, that sawtooth square, triangle, and sine. For fun, I'm gonna make it so that the frequency that um, my keyboard is putting out 
is going to go into an object called sig tilde that's going to convert it into a signal, an audio signal. And what that's going to allow me to do is that's going to allow me to add another audio signal in here whenever I want. And so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to add in another audio signal here from a slider. I'm going to make me a slider. I'm going to make me a slider um, by typing slider into a box as a slider. It can go horizontal. It can go vertical is what they look like. If I get info on them, a little inspector comes up and I could do all sorts of groovy things. Like I can change the color. Let's make the background kind of black. Let's make the on color kind of blue maybe. Make it feel kind of like my ARP. Yeah, I like that. Um, and then we're going to say, you know what? I want you to be able to put out floating point numbers in the range of what the heck does this do? I guess it does like 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. So we're going to say 10,000. Sure. Um, and so that is going to be an offset. All right. So I'm going to take that slider and um, hook it up into the SIG thing. And so now. I can take, um, I can listen to something again. Let's listen to Sawtooth Wave again. Play my, play my uh, melody. And this will offset it, right? It'll, it'll, it'll transpose it up. Um, probably a slick thing to do would make it so that this could maybe also have a number box so I can see what I'm doing. Um, Right, and um, probably an even slicker thing to do would be maybe we don't want it to go up to ten thousand. Maybe we only got I want it to go up to like a few hundred or a thousand. Because what I ultimately want to be able to do with this thing is use it to slightly detune a bunch of these guys. Right, so I don't want to actually um, use it all that crazy um, on an ARP. Just so we, we have a reference photo here of what the ARP looks like. Let's use this one. No, that's not helpful. Let's use this one. That was the first answer was the correct answer. If you look at the oscillators, they have two sliders. They have a coarse and a fine tune. So we're just going to do a fine tune because why not? Um, that's an easier way to see it. You can see the coarse and fine tune. Um, and then there's um, a slider for the pulse width, which is this. Um, and again, I'm going to make this a signal so that I can put in um, something else if I want. So this is for the square wave. All right. And so that's going to be my oscillator too. So we're going to give this a nice fancy label and call this, you know, um, VCO2. And then the way we're going to do it is we're going to um, hook up some things using objects called send and receive. So what this is going to allow us to do is do the thing the ARP does where different modules patch in to other modules. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to say, OK, I got a voltage controlled oscillator. Um, I'm going to give them names and, and send them into a thing called send tilde. So we're going to call this like VCO2 underscore saw. And then I'm going to say VCO2 underscore square. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the triangle, same thing with the cycle. All right? Triangle. And cycle. Cycle. All right, and now the audio is being chucked there. And so if I have a receive object with any of those names, VCO2 square, suddenly I can hear the square wave right out here. I'm, I, so I'm picking it up here. It's being sent there. And so that's going to allow us to kind of encapsulate everything. That's going to allow us to take everything and put it into a little box. Um, we're going to do the same thing with the keyboard. We're going to call the keyboard KBD, um, KBD, 
and just to feel like we're we're still talking old school here we're going to call it kbd cv right so this is going to be the keyboard's control voltage which we're going to receive kbd cv over here and now these things no it helps if you can spell receive it's i before e except after c folks so now these things have nothing to do with one another they're not connected anymore Let's get this out of the way. They're not connected anymore, but they're still going to work. So what's going to happen is I am going to play this note. The signal of the note is going to come out here into here, tune all these guys, and then I can pick them up here and listen. Right? And that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, Right? Maybe I do want a fine-tune thing. I don't know. I don't know if I want a fine-tune thing. That's okay. Um, so if we think about that, that kind of makes sense. Cool. Um, so let's go to the next thing we would do with this, which is let's make three of them and see if we can mix them all, right? And see if they sound kind of nice. So if this was my VCO2, right? The VCO1 copy things in max by just holding down the option key and my VCO3 which I'll put over here are the same thing just made simpler so um, there's no triangle and no sine wave this is my VCO1 my VCO1 I'm pretty sure doesn't even have pulse width modulation it doesn't it just does its thing so I'm gonna get rid of that right it's a much simpler this is VCO1 VCO3 same deal, no triangle, no sine wave, goodbye. But it does have pulse width modulation, so I'll leave that in there. And so if I rename all these things correctly, right, um, what that means is if I want to hear the square wave, say, from the second oscillator and the square wave from the first oscillator, mix them together and make them a little bit out of tune, I would do um, something like this. I would say down here, Here's my VCO2 square, and here's my VCO1 square. I put them together, I turn this up, and I move this guy a little bit out. Right? And so now it's kind of it's kind of a thicker sound. Now the problem is. Maybe the problem is um, what's going on here is um, they're out of tune by me adding a little bit to the frequency. I probably don't want to do that. I probably want to actually multiply the frequencies to make them a little bit out of tune. But that's maybe for a fight for another day. But this lets us get um, something where they can sound a little bit off. And that's, and that's nice. Um, I'm going to fix this. I just realized... This should be in the range of 0 to 1. That's my duty cycle. Um, and this also should be in the range of 0 to 1. Right? Um, cool. And so what this allows us to do, um, which is kind of nice, is then let's make a filter. And what we can do with the filter is we can, just like with an ARP, mix in these other sources. right? And so we could say, all right, let's make a filter. A filter in Max. Um, the low-pass filter is something called a low-res filter. Um, it takes an input sound and, and it puts out an output sound. It has a frequency input. So just like on the ARP, that's my cutoff frequency. Um, and it has a resonance, right, that'll control how much it rings. Um, the ARP filter is a four-pole filter. This is a two-pole filter. So one way to just cheat and make this a four-pole filter is I'm going to make two of them ganged into one another. Um, so I'm going to take one and shove it into the other. Um, this isn't going to sound perfectly like the ARP at all, but it'll sound kind of interesting. And I'm going to send its output to um, BCF, voltage controlled filter, right? Um, so that's where that's where I am that's where I am sending it. Um, all right, uh, and then on my input, 
here's what I want. I want to be able to receive the default ones, which are VCO one square, right? Um, I'm going to say I also want VCO two square, and I want VCO three saw. Those are the um, default inputs on the filter. Um, so, and then I want to be able to give them a volume control. I want to be able to say, um, how loud are you? I could do that with a slider. I'm just going to do it with a number box here. Um, and so this is going to allow me to mix them. Right, it's going to allow me to, to mix them in together. And so I'm going to put them all into this low res thing. And I also need um, a filter cutoff frequency, which I can use a slider for. Right? Um, what I probably want to do is use a slider as well as um, the keyboard control voltage so that it will track with the keyboard control voltage. Um, and you give it an initial frequency. But let's just start simple. Let's just start with the slider down here. Um, and see how far we get. So this is going to be my frequency for my cutoff. Maybe it doesn't go to a thousand. Maybe it's more like five thousand. Um, and then I want a pulse width modulation slider, the thing I was using for the square waves. And I'm going to use that to control the resonance. This is going to be a number from zero to one. I'm going to hook that up to both low reses. All right. And so if I play some sound, um, turn it up into here, and I say I want to receive the VCF now, so I want to listen to the VCF now. Um, if I turn this up, you're not going to hear much. There's a square. There's my slightly out of tune other square. There's my saw. Maybe make the saw a little out of tune too. Cool. And then let's open up the filter. And let's up the resonance. Pretty good, right? So we've got this kind of wah-wah thing. Um, a pretty standard um, part of the ARP, a thing you, a thing you do all the time um, with the ARP is you, um, yeah, that's pretty good, is you will um, make it so that the, 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 the filter frequency um, changes with the envelope of the sound. So that would be, if you listen for a minute, something like this. So that kind of squelch, that bow, um, that makes it kind of brassy, what that is is that's the filter frequency actually changing over time. Um, you would also maybe have a track with the keyboard, so the higher you play on the keyboard, the higher it up we, it goes. So we'll add some of that in a minute. Okay, so that's our VCF. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to put an amplifier on this thing and give it an envelope. And the amplifier um, is deceptively simple. All it is is a multiply tilde object. It's just about the directions we feed the multiplier tilde, tilde object. So if we listen, the problem is the note never goes away, right? So that's the trick. You know, that's the thing we have to figure out. And so what we're going to do, we're going to label this part of the situation VCF, right? Um, so we got three VCOs, a VCF, and then over here we're going to make ourselves a VCA. The, the VCA is going to receive the VCF, VCF. It's going to be a multiply tilde. It is also going to receive something called what? called the ADSR, which we have not made yet, so give me a minute. And then we're going to send it to the VCA output, which we're going to put down here. Right. So this, even though this doesn't look like much, this is a super key part 
of the um, circuit. This is the amplifier. So this is the thing that's actually going to make it playable as notes rather than just droning on forever. All right. So um, we're going to move this over here, and then we're going to make a, an envelope generator. We're going to make a thing called an ADSR. ADSR stands for Attack, Decay, Sustain, Release. There is an object in Max that just does that. Um, and what you do is you give it um, a timing for the attack, the decay, and the release. You give it a level for the sustain. Um, so this is sort of how loud is the steady state of the, of the, of the um, system. And then you send it a bang, and it will generate that curve. Right? So that is going to go to ADSR. Um, and so we're going to make ourselves some sliders. These sliders are going to be the attack time. Um, so I don't know. It's in milliseconds. So maybe that's OK, 5,000. Um, the decay time, same deal. On the ARP, they're vertical. So let's just like keep with the, the visuals. We're just going to turn this slider um, vertical for a minute so we can see what's going on. So that's our, gonna be our attack. Attack, let's label everything. Attack, we're gonna make ourselves a decay. A sustain and a release, this is gonna be decay. This is gonna be sustain. This is gonna be release. Um, three of these are fine as they are. The sustain really should be in the range of zero to one. It's a volume level, it's not a timing. And then the way you trigger it, is you trigger it um, with um, a trigger, basically, with a, with a, with a gate or a trigger. Um, in um, analog synthesizers, a gate is a pulse. Um, a trigger, sorry, a gate, sorry, I just said that wrong. A trigger is a pulse, like a very short pulse. Um, most modular synthesizers, it's around 5 volts. The ARP is a little bit unusual. It's more like 10 volts, but it doesn't really matter. So it's like a little pulse that'll cause something to happen. A gate is something where it goes 1 as long as you're holding down the note, and then you pick up the note, and it's a 0. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to look back at this keyboard now, and we're going to say, OK, the keyboard um, is going to um, generate um, notes based on me turning on and off the notes in here. So I'm going to do that um, by clicking a little thing that says polyphonic, maybe. Is that what I want? I think so. And so now I think I can like play a note and then turn it off. Play a note and then turn it off. Um, what that does in MIDI is it'll put out a number that's a velocity and then put out a zero. Put out a number that's a velocity, put out the zero. I don't care about the velocity. I'm just going to see, hey, are you greater than zero? And this is going to trigger a signal, which I'm going to then send to a thing called, hopefully, gate. It's going to be called gate. Gate. Um, sure which I'm going to receive down here. And now, if I did this right, I set my attack to something really short, set my decay to something kind of short. I feel like these numbers are way too long. So my sustain to something like this. And then if I play a note, if I play a note, I hear nothing. Great. I probably have to turn this up. Let's see if this is going to work. Um, Yep. Cool. I love it. Um, if I up my resonance in my filter, pretty cool. And then a really fun thing to do, because I've got this ADSR in here now, is I could receive my ADSR here give it a scaling factor, almost like a volume control, right? And then plug that into the filter as well. So this now is my base frequency of the filter. If I set this to 1,000, now my notes 
are going to change their frequencies, their cutoff frequencies, right, um, based on the ADSR curve, right? So it'll, it'll go like... So that is getting there. That sounds pretty good to me. All right. So that is your sort of basic layout, right? Um, and the way to make this really feel like we're, we're simulating a modular synthesizer, um, specifically an ARP, is you make um, more than, you make multiple inputs where you can change things. So what we do is we make the receives so that they can have menus. Right, so um, I'll just do one of them just to, to get you guys thinking about it. Um, the receive object can take a message called set and literally anything else you want, literally anything you want. So you can give it a name to replace that. And so we can make a menu. Um, and just for fun, we can make a menu with like literally everything we would ever want in this synth. So, um, so we could uh, go to its list of things and say, you know, what have I got? I got VCO one saw, I got VCO one square, I got VCO two saw, I got VCO two square, I got VCO two triangle, I hope is what I called it. Um, I got VCO2 sign, I got VCO3, right, saw, I got VCO3 sign, no, sorry, square, what else have I got? I got VC, I got the VCF out, uh, I got, I should probably make one called noise, noise, um, I got the VCF out, I got the uh, VCA out, I got the ADSR out, I got all sorts of things. And so what that allows me to do is all sorts of weird stuff here. So if I click this and, and, and keep it all in there, and let's make some noise. You can make noise pretty easily by just saying noise. So we're going to send tilde that to a thing. We send tilde that to a thing called noise. Um, all right, here we go. Noise. Um, and so if I select noise in here, right, Suddenly, um, you guys hear that? Yeah, there's like a whooshy sound. If I give this to all of these menus, all of these receives, you just lost a label. Um, now I can like really, really, really kind of change how this behaves and set up all sorts of wacky things. So for example, there's no reason why the ADSR has to be what's wah-wahing the filter, right? I could say, this is my sawtooth wave, and my square, and my sawtooth wave. <laughs> Then I could say here, I could say, you know what? I want the input of this thing to also be the sawtooth wave. And if you hear that, what's going on is the sawtooth wave of VCO2 is, is manipulating the filter frequency, right? It's creating a, a kind of rumbly, rough sound. And that is a kind of hallmark of modular synthesis. You should be able to send anything anywhere, anytime. Um, so if I sort of populate all these receives, this is the equivalent, more or less, of me um, sending patch cords around, right? Same thing with the gate. I can say, what is, what is going to trigger this? I don't want this to be a, it could be a, it could be a square wave triggering it. Um, this could be um, not the keyboard input. This could be something else, and so on and so forth. So you can get these really interesting, um, you know, kind of systems out of this without, without working too hard. 
um, you know, so I could I could listen to the out of the amplifier, but also just the filter, right? If that makes sense. One thing that's really cool with Max that um, you know uh, a person who uses it a lot will often do is now that I've created this patch, right? Which is starting to look gnarly, but it's not too gnarly. I could then take some things and say, um, add them to presentation, like the keyboard and maybe these tuning sliders and maybe some of these labels, right? And, um, and then if you click the presentation icon, um, right, which is, um, somewhere, um, it's down at the bottom, you can um, then have a completely different view of the, uh, of, the, um, of the patch. And then you can rearrange things. So by, by, by moving, um, by adding these things to the presentation, I can then um, create a completely different view of the whole situation. I think I've got most of it. And that allows me to make something that actually sort of starts to look like an ARP, right? I could say this is my voltage controlled oscillator, zero, one, and two, and three. And I can make like a nice tidy little layout here that um, if I do it right, right, this is what, this is my filter. Did I give the filter a name? Here it is, right? So if I gotta, I gotta add these guys. Two, 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 two. Um, right, and before I know it, my first oscillator is my second oscillator. This is my third oscillator. These are the inputs and their volumes for my filter. So I'll put these down here. These are my controls for my filter. Um, this is my resonance, this is my frequency, right? Maybe move these guys down a little bit. And then this is my um, attack, decay, sustain, release, right? And what is triggering it, I think. Um, so this is my ADSR, this is my VCF. Um, I don't know what that stray VCO saw is. Um, that must have something, right? This is another um, thing for my mixer, for my voltage control filter mixer, right? Um, so these would be sort of audio ins, these would be control ins, right? Um, and then this is my VCA, right? What am I, what am I mixing in my VCA? And then this is my main output. What am I listening to? And what is its main, um, what is its volume control? So we're gonna call this main output. And before we know it, you know, it's starting to, we'll ignore the noise for a minute. Um, it is starting to look a little bit starting to look a little bit like an ARP 2600. If we compare it to the layout of the TTSH, that's not that different, right? There's an oscillator and an oscillator and an oscillator and a filter and the ADSR and the amplifier. So you guys sort of get the idea. Um, so I will take this and I will upload this, and, and we'll we'll put a link um, if you if you're interested in this. Um, to um, you know, we have a GitHub for the Audio Lab. Um, so if you go to the IDM GitHub, and we take a look at the Audio Lab, um, there is going to be a folder somewhere. Maybe I haven't made it yet. Let me make it. 
Um, <laughs> ARP examples. Yeah, that's good. Um, let me push this so you guys can sort of see me do it. And then I'll make some music for you for a while. So we go to the audio lab. We're going to do a pull. We're going to say new stuff. Hopefully this will work. And we're going to say commit. And we're going to say go. We're going to say push. It's going to think for a minute. Do, 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 do. Looks like it's been a minute since I pushed everything. Yay. And now if I reload in the audio lab folder under test patches, this is the thing we just made. So you can download it, open it in Max, and play around. See if you make sense of it. Um, I will maybe do a little bit more work on this and then, and then leave you with some a slightly slicker version of it. But this is pretty close, actually. So why don't I um, leave you guys with a few minutes of music, and then um, you can ask me any questions in the, in the chat if you want. Um, so I'm going to um, go back to my... OBS thing and turn on my full camera. Now you can see me again. And then um, one of the things that I didn't really show is, um, you know, you can you can plug stuff in to the cables, right? And so um, one of the things that is, uh, is is super fun to do is if you grab a microphone, microphone. Um, <laughs> plug in this little cable here, ba -da 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 -da. and now I can take it and I can send this um, through this thing called an envelope follower and use it to kind of mess with stuff. And so if I just want to make some weird kind of wacky noises, um, I could try maybe something like this. I'm going to unplug the oscilloscope for a minute. And I'm just going to take the envelope follower. We're going to listen to the sine wave. And this is a sine wave output. So this is a sine wave output. take this envelope follower, plug it into the frequency, now I can talk and it'll move around. Whoa. So that's kind of fun. So if I'm perfectly quiet, you're not going to hear anything. Whoa. Um, but another thing you could do is you could have it um, control the volume, maybe. So I could say, you know, instead of having it control the pitch on any of these things, maybe what we want to do is we want to have it control the amplitude on something. Right? So we want to hook it up to here. And now the volume is controlled by my voice, right? Hello. Hello. pretty cool. Now we're getting somewhere. So as I talk, it's going to take the volume of my voice and grab it once in a while. That's kind of good there. And if I add a few things, I can do stuff like that.
not bad. Um, and then I think I can even do something where I take the speed of the clock that's sampling and, can, and send it in. Let me try that. Eventually, you'll get some crazy thing. You do it right. Quite as cool as um, not quite R two D two E enough, but it's getting there. Right, so we can definitely play around. Right, maybe I'll make you something a little bit more. I know it's pretty fun. Um, let me make something a little bit more musical. So let's um, maybe unplug the microphone and do something kind of fun. Here's an idea. Let me unplug all this shit. To start with something kind of simple. Let's see. Let's do. Let's do. Whose ad are we going to use? Let's use this guy's ad. We're going to use you. Let's start something. Let's do a C minor.
So you can make something like that in your computer now. Um, so have fun, do some stuff. Um, is there a way to make the mic input follow pitches? Yeah. Um, you need a you need another thing though. Um, this just does amplitude. Um, and so what you would do is you would use a pitch tracker. You would use a um, a thing like uh, we actually have one over here. It's called an IVL pitch rider. And so that's a thing that takes the sound input and tries to Look at the frequency of the waveform crossing, and then and then it sends out MIDI actually, so you can direct drive this thing if you want. Um, yeah, this thing in 1971, it was a little hard to do pitch tracking. Um, the closest that you could do was um, uh, you know sort of waveform crossing subharmonic generation. So if you think of like an octave fuzz pedal for a guitar, that was a thing you could do. But you couldn't actually get the data and turn it into voltage and control a synthesizer with it. That came a little bit later. Um, so you could um, use pitch tracking like things for signal processing, but you couldn't actually like. There's no way to like you know sing into this thing and have it follow your pitch. At least in its original design. Um, but yeah, that was actually one of the things that, ta that was actually it's funny you keep, you mention that. That, that. that was actually like one of the things that like tanked ARP was. Um, the guitar synthesizer that they were trying to build, one of the things that they were stalled out on was the pitch tracking because for, a, for an electric guitar synthesizer, you actually need pitch tracking. You need to be able to read the strings off the pickup and figure out how fast they're moving and then drive the thing. So it all comes full circle to the stuff that didn't quite work out for these guys. Um, but yeah, but I will upload this stuff and um, Hope to see all of you again. It's nice. It's nice to be able to stream with everybody today, and I guess this will live on on YouTube somewhere, and we can all uh, look back on it.
and play around with the bleepy bloopy machine and the max patch. Um, so I will talk to everybody soon, and I hope everybody has a great weekend. All right, and I'm gonna I'm gonna play some music and sign off. All right, I'll talk to you all soon.